Hi everybody and welcome to this uh, Key Stage 4 Curriculum Options presentation from myself, Lee Ratcliffe, and the head teacher here at Calderstones, as, as you will all know. Uh, Mr Williams would normally be with me if we were in person this evening. Mr Williams is our senior assistant head teacher and Mr Williams has responsibility for um, all things qualifications within the school, uh, but also is the person who has the enviable job of writing the school timetable. Uh, and we'll, we'll come to that in a little more detail shortly. Now, normally we would meet and this presentation would be in person in Quarry Hall, but it really is a, sim a very simple presentation. Uh, it's me talking you through the process of uh, how your child should go about taking their options this year and what the, what the system looks like. And so given that it really is just usually 45 minutes of me talking at you, um, it seems sensible that just for now we keep this we keep this remote rather than going face to face. Um, it also means you can watch it whenever you like and go back to it and perhaps discuss it with your with your child. Now your children will get a very similar presentation to this um, in school from from myself at some point in the next few days. Um, but otherwise you you have access to this and you can discuss it with them and go back to it as as you wish. Okay, so the plan is, is, is quite simple, to help you understand uh, the options process and so, so that you're in a position to support uh, your child, uh, to, to reassure you that, that we care uh, about your children just as much as you do about their education. I guess, I guess you could argue you should, you should care more, you're the, you're the parents and you love them, but we like them. Uh, and therefore, it's, it's important to us to help you understand um, that, that we're here to give them as much support as possible. We, we want them to choose the right options because we want for the next two years to have children doing things that they are happy with and that they are, they are pleased with in terms of the options that they've taken. So it's in everybody's best interest that these, these options are sensible. Uh, we'd like you at the end of this presentation and at the end of uh, you having access to our options booklet and, and the parents evening next week, to have a, a better understanding of what our Key Stage 4 curriculum looks like. Key Stage 4 here is Year 10 and 11. Uh, we'd like you to be a little more understandable, understanding of, of why it is that students should choose an option and, and perhaps should not choose an option, and to understand some of the changes that have happened in recent years with those qualifications. Because for those of you who are perhaps of a similar age to me or who have had children who have been through the school previously under a different GCSE BTEC system, there will be some changes uh, in the current system to that which perhaps you experienced 5, 10, 20, 30 years ago. So I'll take you through that as well. And of course, it's also about getting getting children ready for that day. That day. It's not the be all and end all. It's you know, children are here to learn and enjoy uh, and be shaped and nurtured. Um, but ultimately, what it all boils down to in the end is a results day that everybody has their eye on on that day in August 2025, maybe for, for the current year nights. So it's about making sure that we make decisions that get us to that point in as in as fit a state as possible. Okay, as soon as this presentation uh, goes live, we will also make sure that our options booklet goes live. And in truth, much of the information that I'm articulating here and verbalizing here is also in that, that options booklet and in fact it's probably uh, in a much more simpler format that I'm going to give you here so you, again it's another reference point uh, that you can you can use with your child when you're making decisions about options. Um, it'll go live on the website we're not going to print off a, a paper-based copy of that because the vast majority of people don't, don't want one and don't work in the paper-based world but if you do want a paper-based uh, version you can get in touch with us and we can send one to you the booklet contains the kind of advice that i'm giving you now uh, it also contains information on each of the subjects and the qualifications that are available to your child at key stage four so i won't go into that level of detail in this presentation uh, i'm not going to tell you all about child development and, and gcse history and geography and and um, computing for instance i'm not going to give you them the, the granular detail on each of those you can get those in the in the options booklet. And we also have a series of videos that sit behind that as well, that will give you a little more information uh, should you need it and should you be interested in that, that subject. I wrote to all parents about a little bit earlier in the year, I think October, November, just to give you a heads up as to what was on the radar in terms of the options process for, for the rest of year nine. Uh, 
here we are now, March the 2nd-ish, depending on when you're watching this presentation, um, with, with the presentation to parents. And the, like I said, the options booklet will go live on the websites uh, on the back of this, this presentation being released to you. So you can, you can access that immediately. Uh, next week, week beginning March the 7th, uh, I'll give a very similar presentation to students. It won't be identical to this, it'll be a little more personalized to them. Uh, and we'll also take them through the option booklet in a little more detail, not loads of detail, um, but we'll be a little more specific and uh, provide a little more guidance as to how they might use that booklet and the information that's that's captured within it. Uh, on March the 9th is our parents' evening where you'll be able to get the usual kind of progress update on your child and how they've been doing in each of those subjects this year. But you'll also be able to ask any questions and ask advice from subject teachers as to whether, for instance, you think that um, a specific subject would be a good choice for your child, given what you've already read in the options booklet and, and heard here. On April the 4th, that is the deadline by which option choices need to have been completed. Everything happens online and you'll be sent that information in the, in the next couple of days. Um, but we really need the information in by April the 4th. That means that really we can tinker with a few things and, and chase a few loose ends uh, over Easter and in the first few days of, of the summer term and, and get started with the work of beginning to build the timetable. Uh, April the 25th, we return from Easter and we'll begin having discussions at that point with students about the choices that they've made. Um, we don't speak to every student. We don't need to. In some cases, we look at the choices that they've made. They're perfectly sensible. And we don't really feel that every child uh, needs needs a, a microscopic discussion with, with some of us. But in some cases, we'll sit down with the child and, and say, for instance, are you sure? Are you absolutely sure that you've chosen the right suite of options here? because perhaps it looks a little bit odd given what we know about that students, uh, or perhaps they've chosen a combination of subjects that is quite unusual and the students don't normally choose. And that's not to say that we'll be telling them that they can't do that, but we'll just check. Um, and then by May the 23rd-ish, which is pretty much the start of um, the half term in, in May, we should have confirmed everything by then. We should have started to build the timetable. And the timetable for, for this school begins with year nine. We, we already know what current year 10 are doing as they move into year 11. We've got a pretty good idea what the 11s are going to do when they move into 12. And obviously, we know what the 12s are going to do in 13. And we know what the 7s are going to do as they move through to 8 and the 8s as they move through to 9. What we don't know is what the 9s are going to do as they move into year 10. And it, it, it really changes everything for us because if absolutely shed loads of students decide that they're going to do um, computing or sociology, for instance, then it means that we have to make decisions about our staffing for next year because we might not have enough computing teachers, we might not have enough sociology teachers and so on and so forth. So it really gives us enough time, meeting that April the 4th deadline gives us enough time to plan ahead for, for the next year or so. Okay, this might be a little patronising to some of you perhaps if you've had children who've been through the education system since 2016, I guess. Um, but if you haven't, and if many of the changes that have happened over the past few years are, are relatively new to you, then these clarifications might be might be required. Okay, it used to be the case that many of the courses that children took were modular, and that meant, uh, and this is quite a sensible approach, I felt, that you would study something and then you would be assessed on it, and then you would study something else and you would be assessed on it, and then so on and so forth. And that those assessments would in some way, shape or form contribute to a final mark. Um, that worked reasonably well. Uh, but what it did mean was that students perhaps were not retaining information over a long period of time. So that modular system has now been replaced by a linear system. And what that means is that all exams take place at the end of all of the GCSE or the, or the whatever the qualification is, at the end of the qualification. So fundamentally, that means they take place in this school at the end of year 11. Uh, some schools do some courses a little bit earlier at the end of year 10. We don't. We don't feel that students are, are ready for that. And given that they've only just started studying them at the beginning of year 10, we think that that would be too soon. We don't see any reason to rush that. Uh, so at the end of year 11, uh, all students will take all of the, their exams at that point. There are one or two exceptions to that, one or two courses that still have the modular approach. Of, of, of the past. So they don't really exist, although I'll caveat that in, in a second. So one thing worth considering is the number of exams that your child might face 
at the end. Some children love exams. They absolutely love them. I remember being at school and my English course, I think was something like 80% coursework when I did it. Maybe, maybe even 100% coursework. But uh, I thrived on coursework. I thrived on doing things in my own time at my own pace. Some students don't and would prefer the hurly-burly of exams. That, that's fine. But the, the number of exams that your child might face is, is probably an important consideration for you. Here's an example. And it's an extreme example, admittedly, of a, a student who is taking a suite of four subjects that have a heavy load. So I'll come to this in a second. All students have to do English language and lit, maths, the combined sciences, come back to that in a sec. Um, so they're already doing that number of exams without any options actually being involved at all. Uh, if they did GCSE PE as well, then they'd do two two more exams, RS has two exams. And then if that was their suite of options, they'd end up with 28 exams in total. Um, I remember sticking this little image in a few years ago, about three or four years ago, pre-COVID, uh, when it felt like a, a joke that exams might be canceled, but of course, not long after they were. Uh, but 28 exams in a six to eight week period is something that you might want to have your eye on. So in the options booklet, it tells you uh, how many exams there are for each subject, how many exams the children will face at the end uh, when they complete the course. So it might be worth tallying all of that up and thinking, is this, this a bit much? And might there be some mileage in taking a subject that perhaps doesn't have as much of a final exam to it and that maybe has a, what I'm going to describe in a second, as a coursework or controlled assessment element to it, or which has some kind of modular structure to it. With that in mind, um, again, many of you may remember the days of coursework or controlled assessment as it, as it later became known. Uh, controlled assessments replaced coursework fundamentally uh, maybe about 10, 12 years ago. And, but very few subjects still have that. And that, that idea of that I described before of 80% or even 100% of my GCSE English course being made up of, I think, 10 different coursework assignments that I completed over time. Those days are well gone. When I started teaching, um, I think we were doing five pieces of coursework, which equated to 60% of the students' final grade in English. Um, but that, that is no longer the case in English. Everything, just to use my subjects as an example, everything now is, is very much uh, exam-based. Exam uh, so very few subjects. But it's worth looking through to see if you can find some subjects that might have some coursework or controlled assessment elements to it. Controlled assessment means that is it's not quite coursework. They don't have the freedom to take the piece of work home and, and, and polish it in the way that perhaps you might otherwise, because of course, polishing it can also mean plagiarizing it. And that with the uh, advent of um, being able to buy essays online, that became a, a real issue for schools a few years ago. So that's why something called controlled assessments was introduced, whereby uh, the, the work is done in the classroom and there are differing degrees of control that are applied depending on the subject, and depending on the piece of work. So they can't take it beyond the classroom. Sometimes they can have notes with them. Sometimes they can have books and materials with them. Sometimes they can't. Uh, so you will find a couple of subjects still have a controlled assessment or coursework element to it. Again, some students love that. Some struggle, struggle with it quite significantly. So bear that in mind. Have the conversation with your child as to what best suits them. So since 2018, and a little bit before that with some of the, some of the kind of core subjects. Uh, since 2018, we've been working with a new suite. It doesn't feel new anymore, but it might do to you if you've had a child that's been through education previously, or if you've, you, you yourself have been through education previously. Um, we had a brand new set of GCSE courses, first introduced in September 2016, but really every course had come, come online by September 18. So we've had three or four years now of those courses being fully in place, but of course, the, the last couple of years has been significantly disrupted. What you'll find is that many of the specifications are new, they're very different from perhaps the ones that, that your child might have had if, if you had a child went through school seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years ago. Uh, and all of those materials have been developing over the, over the past few years. So there's now a pretty, a pretty good wealth of materials uh, knocking around. Whereas if you, if you were taking the course in September 18, there was really very little in truth. What I would say, and what is really important to understand, is that these courses are far more rigorous than they were previously. 
the assessment approach is different, but the sheer content and the volume of knowledge that children have to get through in these courses is significantly up on where it was under previous specifications and pre previous rounds of qualifications. So I think for everybody, that is something to bear in mind moving forward, that children are just expected to know more and expected to remember more uh, as part of these new qualifications. They are, quite frankly, more difficult than the qualifications have been in the past, partly because of the content, partly because of the nature of the assessments. I suppose that depends on, on your child's preference. And finally here, there's the changes to GCSE grading, which I think most of you have probably come to terms with now. It took us a, a while in school to come to terms with this. The, the best comparison I can think of is, is that, um, that of, of the change in the monetary system in this country, uh, back in the 70s, I want to say, did it change? When um, at one point, you know, something must have been worth a shilling, and then the following day, it was worth 50 pence or 80 pence or one pound 20. And that transition across from one use of a monetary system across to another must have been quite a, a difficult time when a pint of milk cost something one day and then something completely different on another day. That must have been quite a difficult transition for, for people to go through back then. And it was it felt similar in school. Uh, when we went from what we'd, what we'd had for a very long time, a, a tried and tr trusted system of A star through to G, um, which you know had been around for a good 20 years, probably, if not more. And it was replaced with a numerical system, the new GCSE point scoring system that you can see at the top, where nine is the highest that a child can score and one is the lowest. You can still achieve a U grade, an ungraded score, but they're, they're very, very rare, uh, unless children don't sit the exams, or turn up the exams in, in this school. That, that, that comparison there between the old money and the new money, or the old grades and the new grades, is a very loose system. This new system, a, a loose comparison, this new system was not really built to be a direct comparison with the previous system. But what we've been advised and what we've learned over time is that that's as near as you're going to get to a direct comparison, understanding that a four is the equivalent of an old C and a five, the equivalent of a strong C or a B minus. It's there or thereabouts. The nine has been introduced in order to, uh, for those students who are very, very exceptionally able and, and do very well uh, attainment wise in, in the exam in the end. And it goes beyond the idea of the A star in the past, and I guess it, it leaves the capacity to, to add a 10 or an 11 at a later point. But that's the new grading system, and I think some of you will be, be quite knowledgeable about that if you've had children go through the school the past few years. Okay, so these are the subjects that every child has to study. That's not to say that they have to take qualifications in them. Really, no child has to do any qualifications in theory and education, but it would be, it would be crackers if they didn't. Uh, but they have, by law, the children have to study these qualifications. So every child has to study English. The national curriculum tells us that every child up to the age of 16 has to study English. Now, at this school, that leads to two GCSE qualifications, one in English language and one in English literature. So there's two qualifications kind of in the bank before children even have to get to the point of choosing their options. Every child has to do maths. Again, that's compulsory. No matter which school you go to, you will do maths. Uh, and that leads to one GCSE qualification in the end. Science is a little complicated, and I'll come to that in a bit more detail shortly. But if you if, if you look back at when I was at school, I guess, and I'm guessing that some of you might be creaking towards my age, um, then the sciences led, for me, I, I, did, I did dual science. I did, it's called dual science, sometimes called double science. And that means that I studied biology, chemistry, and physics. So I studied all of them. I studied the whole national curriculum, uh, everything that needed to be studied. And it led to two qualifications. It led to um, me getting two grades in what was called dual science. The vast majority of students in this school will do dual science uh, or double science or combined science. It's got lots of different names. Uh, and the vast majority of children nationally will study dual science as well, again. Even though it says dual science, it's chemistry, biology, and physics. So it's the three sciences, but it's joined together to create two qualifications. Some students, however, might want to specialize in the sciences. 
Uh, perhaps they have they see themselves as having a career route in the sciences. Perhaps they're just passionate about the sciences and enjoy it. Perhaps they're very good at sciences. And it may be that they prefer the sciences over some of the other uh, subjects that are in the options suite that I'm going to show you shortly. If they wish to specialize in the subject in the sciences, then they would choose to take what is called triple science. And that means it leads to three qualifications, a separate qualification in biology, chemistry, and physics. So they're completely separate, almost like French, Spanish, computing, three separate qualifications. Whereas if they do dual science, the combined sciences, it just leads to two grades. Um, come back to sciences shortly. Uh, every child has to study religious studies. Uh, that will be one lesson per week over the course of uh, Key Stage 4. And that, again, is because the national curriculum tells us that each child has to study religious studies. Now, some children may choose religious studies as an option. Again, they may be passionate about it. They may be very strong at it. They may see that they have a career uh, ahead of them in terms of religious studies. It may be that they feel it might complement something that they're going to study at A level or, or, or beyond. Uh, in which case they can take it as an option, which means that they, it, will, it will eat up one of their options, but they get to specialise in religious studies. That's absolutely fine. But otherwise, every child has to do religious studies. That's not to say that they get a qualification in it, but they have to study it. Uh, and again, that's a part of our curriculum offer here at Key Stage 4. Uh, some children might tell us that they want to take religious studies on one lesson per week, as a qualification in the end, that they'll, they'll chance their arm at that. And we can have that conversation with them over time. But our feeling is that you really need, in order to do well in religious studies as a GCSE, you really need to take it as an option subject. So if you're passionate about it, uh, your child will take it as one of the options. Uh, PE, again, all students have to do two hours of PE per week. Uh, sorry, they have to do one hour of PE per week. We offer them two hours a week uh, for the most part. Uh, but equally, some children may decide that they want to specialise in PE and, and, and take a qualification in physical education, in which case that's absolutely fine. It's a part of our offer. But otherwise, every child, as part of their timetable, will take PE uh, at Key Stage 4. So that's the compulsory stuff. That's, that's the stuff that, without question, will be on your child's uh, timetable in some way, shape or form next year. And then these are... The options. This is what we offer as options. And you can see you've got the same asterisks there that you had on the previous slide. Uh, I won't go through these in lots of detail. The options booklet does my job for me in that regard. Uh, but I would describe it as a very traditional suite of options, almost wholly GCSEs, where you can see the CNC highlighted. That is a Cambridge National Certificate. And that is the equivalent of the GCSE, it's, it's, it carries the same weight as a, as a GCSE. It's no different in terms of it being a, a doorway to other courses in the future. It's, it's a rose by any other name, in truth. Um, the difference there, and you'll see this in the options booklet, is the way in which it is assessed, because child development, creative eye media, and enterprise and marketing do have that modular approach to it. Now, you will find that a couple of the other GCSEs do as well in that art, for instance, and DT have the coursework elements and the practical elements to it. But child developments, creative eye media, and enterprise and marketing, there is a more modular element to those courses, study, assess, study, assess, than there is with some of the other traditional GCSE courses. But they, they carry the same value and they carry the same weight. You'll see there that there are some, um, and you'll see this in the option booklet, that there are some uh, qualifications that are reasonably similar so you might look at business studies and you might look at enterprise and marketing and think, well, really, content-wise, they look very similar. But again, we offer them both because some students prefer different approaches, different assessment routes uh, and different structures to, to the course. Uh, again, computing is another one here and creative eye media. When you go through the options booklet, you will see that they're not, they're not similar in the sense that computing is very much the science of computing, but creative eye media is the practical application of, of what I would describe as traditional ICT. But it probably doesn't make sense that students take them both. That probably would narrow the field of options a little too, a little too much. Okay, but I, I would describe that as a traditional suite of options, and we get pretty large numbers taking, taking most of those subjects. Uh, there are very, very few 
to to have subjects in there, have numbers in the teens. Uh, most of them are in the twenties and hundreds in some cases, taking some of the big subjects there. Okay, so they're the options. Again, the options booklet contains a page on each of those, and it also gives you a link to a video where the head of department will tell with telling you a little bit more about each of those subjects. Okay, many of your children have been asking me uh, when I've been walking around the school over the past few months uh, and asking many other members of staff about the pathway system that we've uh, employed in previous years. And uh, the short answer to that is the pathway system won't exist in future years. Uh, so uh, there really isn't a great deal of a, a point me, me running you through, but the pathway system fundamentally, historically, split students into a pathway one and a pathway two. Those students in pathway two, two did fewer qualifications but had more time in each of those qualifications. What we're introducing this year is a more equitable approach to the qualification system where all students will do the same number of qualifications, pretty much, uh, depending on what they take, uh, and have the same amount of time in each subject on the basis that we think we can get every student to a similar end outcome uh, based on a similar experience. So we won't be using the pathway system anymore. And, and in truth, it simplifies the process for us and for you, because at, at this point now, I was probably, I, I would usually spend 20 minutes describing the pathway system, and I don't need to. Uh, so same number of qualifications and the same amount of curriculum time in each subject. There are some uh, slight intricacies to our, path, uh, to our uh, option system. Uh, and these largely involve some of the subjects that I've already mentioned, like sciences, religious studies, and PE, uh, but in particular, MFL and humanities. It's a little bit difficult to explain this here, uh, but the option booklet provides a bit more detail on this. So what we'll be asking is that students who've done well in languages and in our school, that's, that's Spanish and French, uh, in the past and in humanities, that is uh, geography and history, uh, that they will take one of those um, languages and one of those humanities subjects as part of their options. And that's the only bit that we block. Now, that's not all students, but it's those students who've historically performed very well in those subjects in the past and who we feel are best placed to do well in those subjects. The reason we're doing that is because they are deemed to be by the government uh, and by many universities and, and higher education institutes as being the facilitating subjects, the subjects that open the doorways, along with the sciences and English and maths, the, the, the subjects that open the doorways on other courses and are enabling uh, in terms of uh, progress to future courses. But that's not to say that if a student is passionate about, uh, passionate about art and photography, that they shouldn't take out art and photography and specialise in those, of course they should. Um, but what we ask is that every child takes a language, um, sorry, most children take a language and most children take a, either geography or history as part of their options. And largely, that's the only restriction that we have. You'll find in some schools and in some timetables, and I remember this myself at school, and I remember it in my old school where I used to work, that the options that you're sent when you have to complete them are blocked. So you'll have, for instance, an A block and a B block and a C block. An A block might contain DT, sociology, um, computing, child development, music. And you have to choose one of those. And then you come to the next block and you have to choose one from B that contains a different group of subjects and C and D until you've chosen all of your subjects. We don't do that. Uh, like I said, the only limitation is French and Spanish and geography and history. We basically open up the entire suite of options to, to the children at that point. And we, and we get them to choose from that, that open uh, option block. And that creates a problem for us because it means that we have to create those blocks afterwards uh, which is painful, it's like a Rubik's Cube with a thousand sides. But it does mean that 99.9% .9 of times student, students get to do the options that they want to do. Uh, by putting them in blocks in the first place, we just don't like the idea of, of saying to children that we are already preventing you from doing some of these options. Because if you want to do DT and music and they're in the same option block, you can't do it. And we don't. We therefore don't set up the option system like that. We get the children to choose, and then we put the blocks in later and try and make it work for as many children as we possibly can. Uh, the common confusion and the common misconception here is between that double and triple science. And there's a couple of other confusions in a second, but that's the most common one. That's the one on parenting that we get the most questions about. 
Um, so if your child chooses to specialize in the sciences, that takes one of their options because by doing that, they get more time in the sciences. So it'll become a little clearer in a second. Uh, but like I said, the majority of children will do double science rather than triple science, but it does cause some confusion. What the science department will tell you if you ask them this question on parents' evening or if your children ask them this question in the weeks and months to come is that doing double science does not prevent anybody from accessing A-level chemistry, A-level physics or A-level biology. As long as you get the grades, it doesn't matter where you get those grades, in double science or in triple science. I guess the advantage of doing triple science is you're having more time in the sciences and you're specialising in those sciences because I suppose that you're passionate about those sciences. Uh, all the confusion is about religious studies, but I think I've probably already clarified that, that everybody will study it because they have to study that, uh, but not everybody will do a qualification in it and the same with PE. Everybody has to do it in order to get the physical activity each week, uh, but not everybody has to take it as a qualification. Right, don't take this as red. Don't take this as being what the option form will look like, but it will look a little like that. Uh, we need to tweak and we need to play around with a few things. Yeah. So if this list is not exhaustive here, don't worry about it. Um, but we'll basically be asking children to look a little something like that. We'll be asking them to take two from there. So for instance, a geography and a French, and there will be some limitations on that. There'll have to be a language and there'll have to be a, a humanity. And then they'll take two of these as well. Um, again, it won't look exactly like that, but it'll look a little like that. So don't take that as being, you know, the law. It, it will not look like that, but it gives you gives you a rough idea as to what it will look like. Um, the reason we ask every child to choose a reserve is because we will not hold them to that to that reserve. Uh, they don't need to worry about us telling them, no, you cannot do business studies, and therefore you must study design technology because that's what you studied uh, that's what you you told us you were going to do as a reserve that it doesn't matter uh, at all they can change their mind on the reserve if they wish and it's very rare that we ever even need to use the reserve uh, option but it just gives us an idea as to what children would choose if they had another option so it's quite telling for us and quite quite interesting and useful for to us some children come in and say i don't want to choose choose a reserve because i, I know you'll make me do it we won't you have my word on that it's here in in the ether now and it's 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 kind of concrete. Um, we will not make any child do their reserve if they do not wish to do their reserve. They can change it to something else if we get to that point, but we very rarely get to that point in truth. Okay, this, this is my advice, and this is what I'll be saying to your children next week. Um, they, they need to make sure they speak to somebody about it. They shouldn't just try and do this all on their own. They need to speak to you, us, me. Uh, the teachers, the well-being tutor, the subject teachers. There are lots of people around that they can they can just poke and ask advice from. They, they we've tried to write that booklet in student-friendly language, so please make sure that they have a good look through it. This is my biggest piece of advice: choose choose subjects that that you love. Um, I remember my school life well, and the subjects that I remember are the ones that I was I was really fond of. So students should choose subjects that they are they are happiest doing they do largely choose subjects that they're good at so when they're choosing between french and spanish or choosing between geography and history they usually go for the one that they they believe that they are best at it doesn't always work like that but when you've got enjoyments and you've got well it's what i'm best at as well then you're nearly there um insofar as you can choose a reasonably broad range of options so what, what i mean that by that really is you don't narrow the options by going perhaps for computing and um by media uh, or, or business studies and enterprise and marketing, they're probably a little too similar in the in the, the nature. And have a look at that course structure, as I said a little bit earlier, have a look at the assessments, have a look at the number of exams. Uh, it doesn't matter how many times we say this, they still do it, but don't choose uh, subjects just because your mate is doing it. And I'll be telling them that next week. Um, and then when I tell them that, I'll see them look at each other and give each other a little wink as if to say, I'm going to do what you do and we're both going to do this subject together, aren't we? Because we'll end up in the same classes. It just won't work out like that. It just won't. Um, so really, they should not choose it based on what their friend is choosing. And that's the biggest hurdle that we get to in September when we give them the timetables and they come and see us and the little lip is out. And they say, but, but 
I thought that I'd end up in the same group as my friend over there and we work really well together. Why can't I be in the same group? And it just cannot work like that. The timetable and just doesn't work like that in school. Uh, they mustn't base it on a teacher. Um, it doesn't matter how, you know, cool they think a teacher is or how much they've enjoyed that teacher's lessons back in year eight when they had them in geography. Um, the moment they start basing it on a teacher, for instance, in, in history, we have eight history teachers and it may well be that they've enjoyed Mr. Derbyshire's dulcet Wigan accents during the course of this year. Um, but the chances are they're going to have one of the other seven teachers next year and they may not have Mr. Derbyshire. So please advise them to just almost forget about the teacher unless they know every history teacher and they know every geography teacher and they're weighing that up and going, you know what? By and large, I prefer the, the suite of history teachers, but I think they'd be hard pushed to make a decision based on that. So I think that's 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 a poor angle to take. Don't leave it until the last minute. And, and while I, there's no harm in handing it in or submitting it on the 4th of April, that's absolutely fine. Um, but what we don't want them to do is to start doing the thinking on April the 3rd or April the 4th and then you know submit the form with, with limited thought. And obviously don't choose limited range. I've already touched on that. Um, they need to make sure they get the right kind of advice and guidance. If they got the options booklet, that will lead them into a series of online links that they can look through. Obviously, you, they can ask questions on parents' evenings. They've got access to, to teachers every single day here who can give them the right kind of advice and are used to going through the system. It is worth them speaking to other pupils in older year groups, perhaps who've been through the system previously or are going through the system at the moment because they're not sure about computing or iMedia or child development or geography history, then they, they, they should should have that conversation. And uh, every year I student will get a careers interview at some point in the next few weeks. Um, but nobody's expecting a year nine child to have made decisions about their future, but we can give them advice and we can give them guidance. And we've got some external people coming in in order to provide that impartial advice to, to the year nine students as they begin that that thinking on the journey towards you know, further education, higher education, employment. Um, so that will happen in the next uh, month and before the point at which they take their options. So they can wait until they've had that careers interview uh, before finalising the form. Okay, so uh, they'll get the options information and guidance on how to select those options uh, at the beginning of next week. Uh, parents' evening is next week, like I said. Again, it depends on how, when you're watching this and those presentations, those are options forms need to be completed by April the 4th. Uh, please select a reserve. We get loads of students who hand it in and they haven't selected a reserve, but it really is helpful to us. And I promise you, we will not use that in any kind of sinister way. Uh, and it's just worth noting that, and this hasn't happened for about 10 years. I always put this in though, that not all courses run. If one student chose computing, then we'd struggle to run computing. Now, that's not going to happen because every year 40, 50 students choose computing. But if we ever got to the point at which, for whatever weird reason, one student chose a subject, then I'd have to have a conversation with that student and say, look, with the best will in the world, we can't run a course for one student. Now, that's just not going to happen. It did happen with textiles about 10 years ago. That was the last course that we stopped running because of that kind of problem. And what we do find sometimes is that some courses clash, that no matter how much we try and make those blocks work, we just can't make them work. And we have to go back to some students sometimes and say, look, we can't quite fit this in. We can't make the combination of subjects that you've chosen work alongside everybody else's. Uh, you've chosen perhaps a combination of subjects that's unlike anything that anybody else has chosen and we can't quite make it work. Again, Mr. Williams, give him credit, is an absolute genius when it comes to writing the timetable. Far better at it than I ever was when I used to do it. And, and he, he just has a habit of making things work in perhaps a way that I couldn't make work uh, uh, all those years ago. So again, rare, but sometimes we do have to go back because there is a clash. Hopefully, uh, this presentation has done some of the things that, that we set out to do at the beginning. Hopefully, you feel you've got a reference point anyway. You might feel a bit better equipped to start the conversation with your son or daughter about uh, GCSE options uh, as we approach next year. Uh, it, it is a smooth process. It goes without without a hitch. And, and the absence of the pathway system this year should just make it that little bit smoother as well. So it is just a case of the children thinking about the subjects that they prefer are most passionate about. Uh, that, that simplifies things a little bit. And again, I'll leave you with the key dates for the year, um, which um, the, the key date being April the 4th, making sure that all those options choices are completed.
completely by that point. There's no rush. Uh, it isn't a first come, first serve. It makes no difference when they hand it in, as long as they have completed it by April the 4th. Uh, that's all that we ask. Okay, thank you very much for your time. Um, again, you've got a chance at Parent Evening next week to come back to us and ask us any more questions. But if you do have any queries, feel free to get in touch. Thank you.